Good day, fellow investors. In this video, I will summarize my economic research over the past four or five years and put it into an investing perspective. There is so much noise when it comes to investing the economy. Will there be a recession? What kind of a recession? Will it be the big crisis, the economic collapse, financial collapse, currency collapse that will destroy your portfolio? Or it will just be a 1991 mild recession and then the world will continue roaring onwards. I'll try to put the most important economic perspectives, facts, into a comprehensive overview of what's going on and what can impact your investing and your portfolio. Let's start immediately with the content. So we're going to discuss Ray Dalio's view. Dalolio is his right Italian name. He shortened it. Ray, Dalio, Ray Dalio's view and uh, Paul Tudor Jones, how they say the economic uh, economic system is broken. There is no more effectiveness in monetary policies. There is a wealth gap. Put that into a global perspective, into an investing perspective, and also show what's going on around the world, not just from a Western biased economic perspective. Let's start. In a recent interview at the Greenwich Economic Forum, Ray Dalio and Paul Tudor Jones, two of the best investors over the last 30 years, have discussed how the capital system is broken, how the world has gone mad because of valuations, and how we are in for an ugly awakening, let's say. But they have been saying that for a while now. Ray Dalio has been announcing a recession for almost half a decade now. It isn't happening. So that's something we have to put into perspective. When investing, it comes to, okay, what are the risks and how can they materialize? And if they materialize, what actually happens? Ray Dalio, and th he discussed that into in his uh, LinkedIn article, the world has gone mad and the system is broken, emphasizes three major problems for the economy. The wealth gap, because all this money printing made the rich richer and the poor stayed poorer. So he forecasts that the poor will start complaining that there will be riots, populism, increasing populism that will lead to a 1930s situation that nationalism later led to the world, Second World War. I will give my counter arguments later. The second issue is the inefficiency of global monetary policy. There is so much debt, you can't increase in interest rates to cool the economy, you can't lower them anymore to stimulate the economy. You even uh, money printing doesn't have an effect anymore on the economy. So the only option is the third option, which is monetary policy free or mod modern monetary policy to simply put money into hands of people and governments, print money, put money to stimulate further the economy, which will probably lead to currency collapse. And the third point he is saying that China is rising as a dominant global power and in history, always when such things happened, there have been strong clashes between the rising power and the established power, China and the US, and that that will lead over the coming decades to trade wars. We're already seeing geopolitical wars. We already see the skirmishes in Hong Kong and what Western countries have to say about what's going on in Hong Kong technology world and capital wars. So that's the environment. I would have a few counter arguments on Dalio's view. First, yes, there is a wealth gap between the poor and the wealth and that wealth gap is increasing. So of course, we might see some taxes, which are very important for Ray Dalio's clients and all those investing. If taxes are increased, your investment returns will be lower on average, but that also depends where you are investing, what you are investing. For the Dalio, it's very, very important. Then thirdly, the poor, are they really, really that poor? Or I come, I was born in a communist country and I went out from poverty to pretty well off very, very fastly. All I needed is hard work, speaking English, willingness to learn. So everybody that is poor, it's not like in the 1930s, if you were working on a dock, there was no way out. Now, there is a fast way out. And even if you are poor, you have probably a mobile phone, you have a house, you have a car. So you are pretty good in the Western world. You're not poor in India. 
And that's also something that we have to, we cannot really compare to the 1930s and the consequences that had happened in the 1930s. On monetary policy printing, I completely agree. Currencies have been and will continue to be sacrificed for repayment of debt for the service of that debt. So if you have debt, you are okay. If you are lending money to people, especially if you're buying bonds, then you are a loser. On China, I think that Asia is really strong and we'll see some data later about what's going on in Asia and how can that impact our investments and everything. And the world is on already, and the key is that to understand is that the world is already so connected. I can now hire someone in India to do some work for me. We are buying so many things in Asia. Apple, Tesla are now selling cars and phones in Asia. There is more than 4,000 Starbucks stores in China already. So the world is already so connected. Yes, there will be skirmishes. There will be some bullying between th those, but at the end, even over the last year and a half, China and the US have been growing together. The world has been growing together. And that's something, thanks to information, thanks to communication that we didn't have in the 1930s, that makes this environment different. However, there is always the uncharted territory of how monetary policy free will look like, what will be the impact on investments, on returns, will be positive, nominal returns, negative real returns. That also depends on what you are buying. Ray Dalio is looking from a macro perspective. He's managing 160 billions, but we as investors and individual investors, we have to look at the micro perspective and analyze each investment opportunity individually. So let's start with the global economy. The environment is full of debt. And according to Dalio and common sense already, we are at what should historically be explained as the end of the long-term debt cycle. The economy grows in relation to productivity growth. The more we can produce as a country, as a nation, the better is GDP growth over time. However, you can spur that growth by taking debt. There are short-term debt cycles and then there is the long-term debt cycle. You see the big line, the big curve here on the chart. And we are now somewhere at the end of the long-term debt cycle. And according to Ray Dalio, this will be a big issue in the future because as we know, it's inevitable for the debt to start hunting you back at some point in time because you are sacrificing future consumption to consume now. That is the nature of that. And it's naturally that it works in cycles and comes back at some point in time through interest and financing. Plus, it's already happening in the United States. The country has to borrow more just to pay interest on the previously consumed debt. So the debt is not used to build schools, improve medical care, infrastructure, or something that's adding value, no, the debt is used to finance interest. Let me give you a short overview of the global debt environment that will also show the unsustainability of large public debts and deficits. And later we'll discuss how those can be solved. So the elephant in the room is debt. Both public and private has skyrocketed globally over the last decades in the US public debt that does not include future, but certain and growing liabilities for healthcare and social securities. You should add 25 billion when we calculate the discounted value to the present day to the current already debt of 22 billion for the United States, the public debt. And that is showing how that has increased 22 times since 1982. The S&P 500 has increased 32 times, 30 times since then. So there might be some correlation. And the fact is that the slow growth of productivity, population growth, slowing population growth and increased global competition leads to a situation where to enable growth, governments, corporations and people have to reach into debt, more and more debt to sustain the economic growth that developed countries have been enjoying for the last half a century and more. No, no government wants to be the bad government and put this to stop. So they keep printing money and lowering interest rates to create a financially stimulating environment. 
This is called pushing on a string. At some point in time, you can't lower interest rates anymore and you can't borrow anymore to finance the interest you're paying on the debt. The best example of how unsustainable this method is can be shown by looking at how 50% of the US budget deficits is used to pay interest on previously issued debt. A scheme where one has to borrow to pay interest on previously issued debt is often called a Ponzi scheme. But for now, there is still trust in the environment. When there is trust in the environment, then you can refinance all those loans at lower interest rates and also the dollar is a safe haven. So compared to other opportunities globally, in this uncertain environment, it is still very, very strong and the United States and other countries that have reserve currencies, despite the debt that those can borrow at very, very low cost, especially as they have the printing, printing press working for them. So it's a very interesting, unusual situation that the world has never been really into. And that's something we have to keep in mind when it comes also to investing. And the deficits are projected to continue to be one trillion dollars and more over the next 10, 20 years. And as long as there is sufficient trust in the US dollar in the American economy, it will be okay to finance debt, albeit the net interest costs are already biting back. The key to understand is why there is no debt panic. We see these huge piles of debt and then no panic. So we have to understand, okay, will that turn into a crisis that was a liquidity crisis in 2008, 2009? Will it turn into a crisis like that? Or the, the hands-on approach that monetary policy and fiscal policy have now will smoothen the ride and perhaps even ease the way out by sacrificing currency. Let's see. Well, if we look at that in Japan, it has been skyrocketing since the 1990s and things there, okay, there is no economic growth, but the well-being of people is continuing, is okay. The Bank of Japan owns 77.5% of all the ETFs in the country and it's on track to become the largest shareholder of public, publicly traded stocks in Japan, owning 4.7% of the total market. So in Japan, if Japan is doing it, why wouldn't we continue to do it? The second reason is that all this money printed creates a lot of competition. A lot of competition lowers prices and we see no inflation. For example, over the past 10, 15 years since fracking oil has become hot, especially in the United States, the aggregate return to shareholders investing money there has been negative. So aggregate investors didn't make money from the US shale oil revolution, but there has been so much supply of oil that has pushed oil prices from 100 to 60 where we are now. And that impacted inflation. So the money printing, the new technologies really impacts also prices, how they are measured. So that's the second reason why, okay, there is no inflation, we can print money. So there is nothing to worry about. And most developed countries have interest rates below 1%, thus the 1.5, 2% in the United States is still very, very attractive and keeps the dollar very strong compared to other uh, currencies like the euro, for example. The fourth reason why few are panicking is of the psychological nature. Ray Dalio has been warning about the debt cycle for half a decade now, but nothing has really happened when something doesn't happen. People tend to disregard it as a possibility, as a risk. It's like the fact that insurance sales spike just after a hurricane has struck. People need to see risk to embrace it. The last time long-term debt cycle was risky was in the 1930s. The 1930s is something that probably nobody watching this remembers. So when will all this really matter? When will the chickens come to roost? Well, as Dale Dalio says, in the next recession. And when will the next recession come? Again, nobody knows, but let's see. So the next recession, everybody is expecting the next recession since 2010, from what I'm hearing and following the investment news. But as soon as there is weakness, 
The ECB pushed another 20 billion per month for as long as it takes for the Eurozone's inflation and growth outlooks to return to satisfactory levels. The Fed, as soon as it increased interest rates, bam, soon down, down, because we are slowing down growth. So there is an immediate action from monetary and fiscal policy to prevent any kind of recession, lower taxes, more investments, uh, high fiscal deficits. So that's something that we cannot know for how long can all this financial engineering today postpone recessions. And then also, we don't know the magnitude of a recession. If there is a recession and there is so much money plowed into infrastructure, into growth, into perhaps even helicopter money through monetary policy free, we might not see such a bad recession as Ray Dalio is expecting. They can print money. There will be issues, crises around the world with those that have debt in foreign currencies, for example. But the United States, China, Europe, they can always print themselves out of their problems. Perhaps. We will see it's uncharted territory. A key to understand is there will be high investments in infrastructure and the new ECB president Lagarde says that uh, governments should have larger deficits to invest in infrastructure, which tells us, which tells us, okay, we have to invest in infrastructure related investments because there will be a lot of money coming in to build all those new bridges, trains and whatever. And then you have to find the best low risk, high return investment vehicle to do that, which gives you margin of safety. Now, the next recession and the impact of it. The last two recessions were very, very bad for the stock market, down almost 50% in both cases. It didn't last long, but that is what investors expect. However, we might see financial engineering and currency sacrificing that might not lead stocks to fall. Maybe we'll, hear, we'll see five years of zero returns, but it's possibly that financial institutions, like we see with the Bank of Japan buying 5% of the Japanese market to do whatever it takes to protect it, to, to uh, spur people to spend more money, we might not see the 50% downturns we have seen after the dot-com bubble and the Great Recession. So the investing message is pretty simple. Invest in businesses that will do okay if there is a recession, but will do great if there isn't a recession. So again, low risk, high reward investing is the key what you have to think about. If you're investing in businesses that have shady fundamentals that will go bust if there is a re recession, liquidity crunch, too much debt, then you are gambling. And that's not really investing, that's not really sustainable over the long term for most investors. The long term solution to this debt cycle is simply to print money, let inflation run a little bit higher, print, print, print. And of course, those that have buying, been buying bonds will be the suckers. But that has been something going on since ever. Governments always debase their currencies and there are always their currencies always lose their value. So it's better to be invested in real assets. If we just look at inflation, they say inflation is low, but then de it depends on how you're measuring it. If you measure inflation as it was measured in the 1990s, it's around, it has been constantly around 5%, not 2%. And then if you look at the things you really need in life, education, Harvard education tuition went from 40,000 to the current 65,000 in 15 years. That's more than 2% a year. If you wanted to buy a ha home in Amsterdam or New York, it was 120 years ago, now it's 500. That's more than 2% a year. If you need a new hip, it costs five times more than 20 years ago. So those are the things that really matter. And then your pension. If you need to buy stocks now, it costs 30 times more than in the 1980s. And you retire on your yield, on your income. So now to retire costs 30 times more than it did uh, 30 years ago. So that's something you have to put into perspective. There is huge inflation depending where you look. Aggregate statistical numbers don't tell you much. What is my real focus and what I see as the predominant economic force over the next decade, few decades, is Asia. And I really want to give you some facts about it that will 
put a completely different perspective on what's going on in the world. If we look at real GDP growth in uh, Europe, in the United States is really, really slow, zero, 1%, 2%, so not really a positive situation. But if we expand and give it a global outlook, global perspective, we see a big chunk of the world, Asia, growing between three and 10%. That's 4.5 billion people, while the developed countries have 1.3 billion people. That's huge. And I think really that the Western media outlets bias our perspective on how the world really is developing, what is really going on in the world. 4.5 billion people growing at, let's say 5% per year, that's something huge. That's something that has never been seen in the world. India has just started to grow and that's really what has to be the main economic topic ever. Not a recession, not crisis, that's all local news. You have to put things into global perspective. Plus the 4.5 billion people are mostly young. The population pyramid is very, very healthy. So there is so much positivity there, so much tailwinds that we cannot even imagine. There is something that makes comparing things to the 1930s like Dalio is doing practically worthless. In the 1930s, the New Deal saved America. Okay, today we have the Chinese One Belt, One Road initiative working and developing the world trade wars or no trade wars, this thing is moving forward. The purpose of the One Belt and One Road idea is to construct a unified large market and make full use of both international and domestic markets through cultural exchange and integration to enhance mutual understanding and trust of member nations, ending up in an innovative pattern with capital inflows, talent pool and technology database. The number of countries that have signed documents related to the initiative is staggering. This is 5 billion people or and more growing fast. That outweighs the issues that might be happening in the developed world over the next 10, 20 years. Then there is so much that still has to happen that can easily outweigh the bad again. Just an example is urban urbanization. Uh, 250 million people will move to cities over the next 10 years, which or whatever happens in the economy. So 250 million more infrastructure, more roads, more, bu more buildings, more growth, more consumption. And the fact is the world is so much more connected today than it was in the 1930s that really this connectivity I think is a safety net for long-term human well-being. And if there is well-being I think we as investors can do really really well. So what are the main points that we should take from this as investors? Currencies will be sacrificed. That's a given. That has been always the case in the history of humankind. So we have to invest in assets, great assets, great businesses that will do well no matter what happens. That's the best answer that I can give to any kind of economic, macroeconomic discussions. And focus on the micro, find those good gems that if you look, you will find them. So the, secondly, the global economy will do well. Developing Asia is such a strong power that it is incredible, really, really incredible. If you go to Asia, you will see how that works. So what will I do? I will park my money where it has strong tailwinds to grow, where it has protection, margin of safety, normal value investing that works well all the time. And then there is something I would close this that will really shift your perspective. The world in 10-15 years will be completely different than it is now and we cannot even imagine how it will look like. If somebody would have told anybody 12 years ago that we will have 10 years of zero or negative interest rates, they would say, oh, this guy is crazy. If somebody would have told the main economists 30, 35 years that the dominant economic power will be China. In the 1980s, China was a pure communist country just exiting huge starvation famine in the 70s and the 60s. And now they are the dominant power. So see how things evolve, change extremely fast. Uh, 30 years ago we had no emails, now we can do business all over the world sitting at our desk, at our computer and you are watching me from who knows 
where that's the new world, it will be completely different in the next 10-15 years, but there are the fundamentals of value investing that will always work and that's why we have this channel. So please subscribe, I'll keep really giving you videos that give a great perspective on what's going on. We'll go into asset classes, we'll go into education, fundamentals, uh, analysis, all the most important facts when it comes to investing. We'll put it into a free book later. So you can also read this on my website. I'll put the link in the description below with a published article if you prefer reading to watching. Thank you for watching. Looking forward to your comments. Please like this if it gave you value. Share it and thank you and I'll see you in the next video.